I'm at, um, well, on the banks of the Arikari River at a place called Beaches Island. Today, you come down a series of country back roads to this location in eastern Colorado, um, down by the banks of this river, which is mostly a dry wash unless it's the rainy season. Um, you know, this is a picnic spot now. There's picnic tables here, some horseshoes, you know, for rings for playing horseshoes, a couple of barbecue and fire pits. It's a little quiet, real quiet corner. So why am I here? Well, when I was a boy, and we are talking 45 years ago, 46, 47 years ago, when I was a young boy, one of the things my father gave to me was one of his books from when he was a young boy. Now my father grew up in the, was born in the late 40s, grew up in the 50s with uh, all those cowboy and Indian TV shows um, and Western comics and you know my father was a lived in England but my father was a member of the Roy Rogers fan club and um, really loved that you know those cowboy and Indian tales and, and Western movies and that kind of stuff so my father had a book which was the uh, Billy the Kid picture book from 1958 so it was full of fanciful tales of a, of a Billy the Kid who lived a daytime life as William Bonnie ranch foreman who never carried a gun but if there was trouble brewing, he'd like dress all in black and put on a mask and he'd be Billy the Kid hero. Anyway, so there's a whole bunch of uh, comic strip stories in there about this fictionalized Billy the Kid character. There's also a lot of factual stuff in there, you know, because these are books designed for little boys who want to know, well, you know, what kind of what kind of rifle did a mountain man carry? And, and what is a Bowie knife? And, you know, what did General Custer really look like? So there's like a whole bunch of in, interspersed with these um, fictional cartoon stories of, you know, like Billy the Kid fighting a vaquero or Billy the Kid in a horse race or, or that kind of, th or those stories, there's all these factual stories. One of the stories that's in there and that's rendered in a, a comic book fashion, so comic strip fashion over several pages, I might take a... Um, scour those pages and upload them at some point but anyway one of the stories that's in there is the story of the battle of beaches island it's a indian fight to use the old terminology so it's a fight here along the banks of the arikari river at this spot um, between a company of frontier scouts and uh, Major Forsyth, a second command, Lieutenant Beecher. So there's a company of 51 scouts. So these are not army blue jacket personnel. They are um, civilians hired by the army to serve as armed scouts. Um, and the battle here took place with, the estimates say, anything from 700 to 1,000 uh, Native Americans, um, probably Cheyenne, some Arapaho, some Lakota um, joined in with that. So an overwhelming force of Native Americans fought here. And as a young boy, I read that story. And it was, you know, a very 1950s type version of the story with the uh, heroic daring do of the men that fought here. But also it was interesting because Despite it being 1958, and what with the uh, cultural representation in popular media of Native Americans at the time, it didn't really portray the Native Americans here as like um, bloodthirsty, cutthroating savages. It did focus on the uh, warrior Roman nose, a noted warrior, um, not a chief. Um, but just an exceptional warrior who was noted for his uh, bravery and courage in battle. 
who was one of the leading warriors here during that battle and actually died here fighting against Forsyth's men here at Beecher Island. Um, the island, of course, was not called Beecher Island. The Arikari River is um, dry for most of the season. In the battle took place in September. Um, there was a little water in there and in the centre of the river is a sandbar, a small sandbar covered in sagebrush with a couple of cotton trees on it. Um, so this is where the battle took place. Um, and of all the stories that were in that book, that 1958 book, this was the story that I enjoyed most. Um, this is the story that meant most to me. It was um, not cowboys and it was not John Wayne and it was not cavalry charges and, and that kind of thing. And it was not irregular stand up, sort of like they died with their boots on nonsense with Errol Flynn and, and uh, you know, when you watch those movies and it's just like, this is a bunch of white guys in like um, makeup wearing bad wigs. But so it wasn't that, it was, I just thought the portrayal of the scouts struck me as like, wow, these guys are like, you know, out exploring. I'm a Cub Scout, you know, I'm going to, on Wednesday nights, I'm going to my Cub Scout meetings and we're learning to tie knots and, and make secret signs out of sticks and read trail, you know, cut trail and, and read sign. So, you know, like, wow, this is really, this is really great stuff. Plus also the, um, the Native Americans are portrayed as, in this story, as brave warriors that fought bravely here. Um, it was a three-day battle. It was actually a three-day battle um, and then held on for like another uh, six or so days um, where the men are stranded here because of the loss of their horses. Um, there's um, some sniper fire, but the Indians have mostly departed because their villagers have moved on, knowing that there's been a conflict here and that probably more soldiers will be coming. Um, but they're portrayed in a in a in a reasonably sympathetic light for 1958. And then also the relief party that comes to them, um, the relief party of US cavalry that came to them here at Beecher Island at the conclusion of the Battle of the Siege was um, Buffalo Soldiers of the 10th Cavalry. And I had never, as a child, I'd seen, you know, I'd seen they died with their boots on and I'd seen, um, she wore a yellow ribbon and I'd seen, you know, the searches. I'd, I'd seen Western movies on TV, watched those with my dad. But it had never occurred to me that there were black soldiers. And here in this storybook that I'm reading as a, as a young boy is like, wow, there was a regiment, in fact, more than one, the 9th and the 10th Cavalry and then some infantry regiments as well. But here's a regiment of black soldiers, nicknamed the Buffalo Soldiers, but black American soldiers fighting in the West. That was my first exposure to that. I mean, I'd never seen, say, Sergeant Rutledge as a movie, um, you know, good or problematic as Sergeant Rutledge is, but I'd never encountered that, um, I'd never encountered that fact that there were these black American soldiers. And so to me, that was like, wow, Buffalo soldiers. This is a really, really cool thing for me as a little kid to like learn this. So, of all the years I've been traveling and of um, the 20 plus years now I've lived in the United States, Beaches Island has been one of the places I've wanted to come to. Um, it is literally in the middle of nowhere as it was then, it is now. It's down a lot of back roads, um, not well signposted and you, the there's no cell service out here, your GPS will fail you. Um, so you need to rely on good old fashioned map reading. Thank you Cub Scouts, once again. Um, so, you know, do your land nav and uh, you'll end up here right. And that's pretty cool. So I've always wanted to come here. And I've lived in the United States now for 20 years, maybe 21 years. and. Yeah, 21 years and we've been to the west before so um, with my son I've been on a road trip 
and I made it up to Deadwood, you know, South Dakota with my kid. That was a big deal, you know, we went to Deadwood, South Dakota. We were down in Arizona one year, we went to Tombstone, so, you know, I've knocked off those couple of locations that I remember as a kid, these were sort of like interesting locations, but I've never been in the position to get out to this remote battlefield site in uh, rural eastern Colorado. So I was in, staying in Boulder, Boulder, Colorado, which is about 200 and something miles to the west. And I had a day to myself and I thought well, I'm going to get up and I'm going to get coffee and I'm going to get in my car and I'm going to drive and I'm going to go to Beecher Island and I'm going to do it. And so that's exactly what I've done and I've actually made it here to this place that um, has meant a lot to me since I was a small boy, piqued my interest in American history, uh, piqued my interest in things such as buffalo soldiers, how that's very, very interesting, and uh, piqued my interest in it not just being a bang, bang, pow, pow, cowboys and Indians movie that I'm watching on TV, but, you know, the uh, warrior ethos and the uh, humanity and the, the culture of the Native Americans represented in that story. Um, so you have to remember that the, at this period of time, we're talking just after the Civil War, um, this territory here, this corner of sort of like Nebraska, Colorado, Kansas, was heavily disputed territory. Settlers were moving into the territory under the Homestead Act and, and trying to ranch, trying to farm here. And the military moved in obviously um, with those because there were Native Americans already here who were not pleased. Um, so the military moved in to, some would say, act as a barrier between the settler population and the Native American population, and others would say to push the Native American population out. So there been a series of conflicts, um, a series of raids, a series of ranch burnings, and so on and so forth. This was disputed territory. Um, the army was, in its post-Civil War status, reduced once again to a very, very small professional army with a lot of country to cover. And one of the ways that they were able to just slightly expand their coverage was um, General Sheridan, in command of this department, authorised the creation of a company of scouts, 50. Um, they'd just be employed on the, uh, on the quartermaster payroll as scouts rather than as uniformed troops. Um, so the official number of troops in the US Army would not change and Congress would not be upset. These were just temporary employees of the Quartermaster Department. But these men were men that were equipped with a horse and a saddle and a Spencer rifle, you know, seven shot Spencer repeater, a good Colt revolver, six shot Colt revolver, and ammunition and supplies and organized in a company of 51 under command of uh, Forsyth and that they would come out and they would be a scout rangering group that would pursue the Indians, um, pursue the Native Americans, so if there'd been a raid, in this case there'd been a raid on a, on a railhead, on the Kansas City Railroad, railroad Head, and um, which had been reported as 25 Native Americans. Um, so the company of scouts departed and uh, took, up that, took up that trail, picked up the sign and, and followed them. Um, the sign then increased and the more experienced frontiersmen amongst the scouts reported to um, Major Forsyth that you know they were not now chasing 25, they were chasing 100, 200, they were chasing a lot more people and that it looked like that what they were coming up against was multiple bands, multiple villages that had come together somewhere and that the war parties were gathering together from those individual bands and those individual villages were gathering together into a larger group. Um, so Forsyth knew that he was outnumbered, but, you know, he said, you know, we were hard to fight Indians, you were hard to fight Indians, and I was, came out here to fight them, and I'm going to go find them, and we're going to fight them. We're going to fight them. That's what we're going to do. Um, brave, maybe. Foolhardy, maybe. Um, but they pursued on. So on the night of um, 16th of September, um, Forsyth and his men reached here, the Rickery River, 
and it's about four o'clock in the afternoon, uh, 16th September, and Forsyth decided that it was a river, and a good river source, could be a good place to water the horses and the mules, and um, put, set them to pasture, and um, it'd be a good place to camp. So, so even though it's four o'clock in the afternoon, they could have put more miles ahead of them, they decided that, no, this would be a good place to camp, we'll just make an early night, um, we'll get some rest, we'll rest the horses, we'll water the horses, etc. If they had gone two miles further on over the ridge line ahead of me, where the gentleman on this SUV is just not, uh, the SATV is just bombing around them. Um, the ridge line ahead of me, over the ridge line around the corner, there was an ambush party waiting for them of several hundred Native American warriors. Um, they'd have ridden right into the ambush. It had been similar to the Fetterman massacre. They'd have been wiped out to a man. It's by the stroke of luck that they decided to camp here that they were not wiped out that night. They camped here overnight at dawn on the 17th of September. Um, Forsyth was awake and making rounds of the sentries. And he was with a sentry and they both spotted coming over the ridge from the north um, uh, mounted Native American warriors. And so the scout fired a warning shot to rouse the camp, yelled out, turn out Indians, turn out, roused the camp, and the men became um, engaged almost immediately in a battle. Now, these were not regular soldiers, as I said, if this had been regular soldiers, they would have put out um, picket lines, so they would have put down picket pens, run a line, tied the horses to those picket, picket lines. But these were frontiersmen. Um, some were experienced Indian fighters, some were less experienced, some were farmers. Um, but remember, we're talking like Kansas frontier farmers from this period. These are not people that are just like cut and corn. Um, these are people that you know knew how to ride, knew how to shoot, knew how to defend their farmland. Um, and there were a few inexperienced, like a Pennsylvania, a Philadelphia um, store clerk. I mean, you know, there was a few young people in there as well, but like the majority were experienced men on the frontier. So they had not just lined their horses up tied to a rope. The men slept with their horses' uh, reins wrapped around a hand and the horse picket pinned next to them and in their other hand their Spencer rifle um, because they knew if they were jumped they would need to be able to get on their horses and they would need also be able to need how to fight. So when the attack came that early morning on 17th of September and the men were roused from their sleep, wrap that rein around here, I hope your horse is not going to jack you away and get your Spencer rifle up. And you've got that seven shot Spencer rifle and you've got 50 men firing and um, uh, repeating rifles against charging light cavalry. Um, so the battle here is very swift. Um, uh, is uh, the initial charge is beaten back. Um, Forsyth then has to decide what to do. Um, he knows that there are hundreds of uh, hostile enemy out there. Um, he doesn't know whether they're behind him, to the side of him or not. He has no intelligence on that. Um, so he will assume that they are, um, you know, because as Native Americans' tactic is not just direct frontal assault. It's just silly. They would have come around the side probably forded the river to either side of the camp. So Forsyth has to decide what to do. Are the men going to mount and try and cut their way out, break their way out? Um, or are they going to make a stand here? And if they are going to make a stand, where are they going to make a stand? Are they going to make this stand here on this riverbank? Or are they going to make the stand somewhere else? Um, Forsyth decides to move the men, using my comb for my pointy stick today to avoid the knife ends. And he's going to move the men from the riverbank to the sandbar in the river. Um, the river is very shallow at this point. I mean, it has been September and rain has come, but the river is shallow. Today, it is August and the, ri and the river is completely almost dry. Um, so there's a little bit of water, but the sandbar is there. And, but Forsyth considers that to be a defensible position. Um, tries to rally the men and get the men with their horses onto the sandbar. So as many of them can get their horses onto the sandbar do. Um, the charge has managed to take off a few of the horses, a few of the horses have bolted and also they've managed to, the Native American in that cavalry charge, have managed to carry off some of the mules, um, which is going to prove difficult because that contains most of the medical supplies, most of the food rations and also some of the ammunition reserve. So the men carry um, 
a lot of ammunition themselves on their person, um, but their ammunition reserve is out. So now every shot that they're going to make has to count. They can't afford to waste ammunition uselessly. Um, they make their way onto the sandbar. They start digging slit trenches, fighting holes. I mean, some of these men are veterans of the Civil War, so they know what they're doing. Um, the mules that have been captured, uh, uh, unfortunately, are the ones with the picks and the shovels. Um, so the men are having to use tin plates, tin cups, um, knives, um, carbine butts to scrape out fighting holes and, sh and fighting shells and uh, some slit trenches and defences and pile up any brushwood they can find into uh, temporary embrasures. So there are further charges um, throughout and attacks throughout the 17th, 18th and 19th. In one of those attacks, we don't know which um, because accounts vary um, from the survivors in Forsyth Party. Um, um, I mean, remember we're talking um, uh, subsequent interviews with Native Americans that fought in the battle indicated that there were perhaps 900 Native Americans involved in this battle total. So we're not talking about one or two war chiefs, we're talking scores, dozens of, of notable um, distinguished figures that you could pick out in, in, a, in a swarm of men that are coming towards you. You can see the ones that have got leadership quality and leading small bands. So Roman Nose is one of those, and um, so people say he fell in the first charge, he fell in the second charge. We don't know. We do know from the um, oral accounts of Indian history that, sorry, Native American history, that um, Roman Nose had had his uh, medicine broken that day, that morning. He'd uh, taken a meal with one of his uh, friends. Um, he'd been given a war bonnet that had been said would, if he kept his medicine, if he kept his, you know, his, his purity, um, this war bonnet would protect him from bullets. And one of the medicines that he had to keep, one of the rituals that he had to keep, was that he could eat no food that had been touched um, by metal, so nothing that had been cut by a metal knife, stirred by a metal spoon or in a cast iron pot. So you could only eat things that had been prepared with like um, antler knives or in wooden bowls, etc. He did not know until he had finished the meal um, that the person that had cooked the meal had used a uh, metal spoon to stir the food. When he found out that, he realised that his medicine had been broken, um, could only be restored by a um, purifying ritual. There was no time for a purifying ritual. Uh, members of the war band looked to him for leadership and for an example of courage. They're like, you're the great warrior, you're one of the great warriors here, you're one of the leading f fighters here, um, you need to be in, in the front ranks, you need to be um, inspiring the younger men to come forward and, and join you in the charge and you need to show personal courage and bravery. And so he did and um, was felled by a bullet. Um, whether that's because he, he broke his medicine or um, whether that's because it was just his time. Um, but Roman Nose was killed here and there's a trail up onto the ridge line called the Roman Nose Trail that we might walk later. But anyway, so the, uh, at night, um, two of the scouts, Trudeau and Stilwell, managed to sneak out of the encamp of the encirclement and to try and make their way to uh, Fort Wallace or a nearby fort and raise help. Um, but that would take them several days to cross, like the 120 miles to get there. And so the surviving scouts here um, just had to endure a siege of a nine day siege in total. Um, their horses were all killed. They were able to use some of their horses as cover to hide behind. But the putrefaction in a three, four day old animal in hot weather can only be imagined. They were low on food. So the only food they had was horse meat from increasingly putrefying horse meat. Um, the only water they had was the muddy trickle in the stream itself, which could only be gathered in the evening at night 
because to move around during the day would attract rifle fire. Um, rifle fire wounded Forsyth, shot through both legs. Um, one shattered his femur. He would always walk with a limp after that. He would also have been struck in the head. Um, second in command, Lieutenant Beecher, was killed here. Um, the island was named Beecher Island after Lieutenant Beecher. Um, the company's doctor was killed. So the men had to attend to their own wounds with whatever they had, which was just mostly strips of cloth. And they held here until relieved by um, troops from the 10th Cavalry Buffalo Soldiers eventually relieved them here on the banks of the Erickery River, by which time the Indian war parties had broken up, um, broken up their villages and packed their villages up and moved their women and their children away from here. And as soon as the women and children were moving away and were safe, the war parties began to withdraw. So by the time the um, cavalry relief column arrives, the Indians have departed. Um, so it's one of those, almost a last stand, it's like a heroic siege and stand in history, a small number of men outnumbered, holding off a larger number of men. Um, but if you are a Native American and you may be armed with a trapdoor Springfield taken at the Fetterman fight, or you may be armed with a rifle that you've purchased, a trade rifle, um, so you're armed with a firearm, but you're also armed with lance, spear, bow and arrow, and you're mounted on a horse. And if you're going to charge these men who have repeating rifles and repeating pistols, repeating revolvers, that can lay down volleys of fire. Um, so each of these Spencer carbines held seven rounds. Um, if the men were too badly wounded or the men were, had been killed, their ammunition and their spare rifles would be passed to another man. So a man may have two rifles fully loaded. So you can fire a volley and 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 a volley. And that's your Spencer empty, but you may have another Spencer to pick up and fire seven more. And now you've got your Colt revolver. Six shots from that. So the amount of fire that's being put out by this um, small body of Americans is intense, intense. And to brave that and to risk that in um, either attack on horseback or to dismount and try and advance on foot using the rolling land and this is prairie land so there's a lot of roll, rolling land in this so you know you can drop into dead land in, in dead, cut, dead ground in a gulch and then rise up again and sprint to another piece of dead ground and use as much cover in the land the folds of the land as you can but to do that you're continually exposing yourself to fire and to do that is is you know to assault a defensible position is bravery in itself you know um, the defender always has the advantage um, and the attacker does not because the attacker is usually out in the open and the defender is like you know down behind a in a small even if it's a shallow slit trench that he's dug with a uh, tin plate and piled up a couple of bits of brushwood in front of it he has cover you do not so to attack him um, and expose yourself to um, repeating fire is an act of bravery and so from both points of view the courage of the men on both sides here is just has is remarkable um, none of these scouts broke and ran. Nobody tried to like grab a horse at the beginning and sprint out. And I mean, they would have been slaughtered before they'd gone a hundred yards. But nobody ran. They stayed together. They had unit cohesion, and they fought here. Um, some of the men may have thought, "Well, if we're going to die, we're going to die fighting." That may have been their attitude. But um, they fought here, and so the bravery on both sides, the determination on both sides just has to be admired. And um, I made it here. I'm 52 years old now. Um, I guess I first read those stories when I was six or seven years old and enjoyed those stories and have come came back to those stories and read that book over and over and over. Uh, if you put it in front of me I could probably just look at the pictures and without even looking at the words from the speech bubbles. I'll probably remember the dialogue word for word. Um, and I made it here, in the middle of nowhere, in Colorado. 
and um, unfortunately I can't spend as much time here as I want to because it took me over uh, over three hours to get here and it's going to take me over three hours to get back. Um, once I hit Interstate 76 it's going to be plain sailing but it's going to take a lot of time on uh, back roads and uh, country roads before I can actually get back onto a main road and, and get some mileage going but it's going to take me over three hours to get back so unfortunately I'm not going to be able to spend as much time here as I wanted to. Well while we're here we might as well take full advantage of being here. So it's a barbed wire fence to prevent me from wandering into the river. You can see there's a good solid steel bridge there on Country Road KK. The road's not even numbered, the road is actually lettered. I came off Country Road JJ onto Country Road KK. Um, the riverbed is here, you can see it because there's these trees and bushes in the riverbed. Um, once you go the other side of the water course, of course it opens up into just open plains territory. So we're down where the water flows and in wet season the river will be higher. But at the moment the river is at a very low dry point. There is a memorial here to Foresight Scouts. Um, it lists the names of, on the memorial itself, it lists the names of the uninjured. There is a separate, separate memorial next to it for those that were injured. And then each of the men killed here has his own individual memorial. The men were actually buried here on site um, later. A recovery party came to disinter those graves to take the men back to be buried elsewhere um, but some of the graves had already been disturbed and tampered with but so here we are the Beaches Island Memorial <clears throat> battle itself fought September 17th 18th and 19th 1868 between George Forsyth's company of citizen scouts numbering 51 men and a large party of Indians comprising Northern Cheyennes, Oglala and Brule Sioux, and dog soldiers, that's Cheyenne dog soldiers, commanded by the noted war chief Roman Nose. The scouts were surrounded and held onto this island for nine days subsisting on horse and mule meat. Indians killed, 75, wounded unknown. Here, Roman Nose and Medicine Man, another leader, fought their last battle. Records the names of the uninjured survivors. So a fair range of names. You see Irish names and German names and French names on there, reflecting the immigrant nature of the United States itself. There are some buildings here. I believe this is used as a campsite. Cub Scouts. There is the wounded. Forsyth himself was wounded. Um, so you can see William H. H. McCall, Sergeant Major, also wounded. And then the individual markers for the men that were killed here Farley, Wilson. Lieutenant Fred Beecher, veteran of Gettysburg. Dr. Moores, the company surgeon, killed early on. And Calder. And there is a separate memorial here. We can see two troops H and I, 10th Cavalry Buffalo Soldiers, were dispatched from what is now Cheyenne Wells. Colorado. Troop H arrived on September the 25th to the relief of the scouts who were known to be in danger of total annihilation by superior force on the Rickery River. So I just want to
take you just away from the watercourse for a moment up towards one of the ridge lines from behind which the Native Americans attacked just so that you can see when we've moved away from the river and the trees that are down by the river in that watercourse once you move away from the river and the sagebrush There's a little tributary here with a water in, but once you look up on that ridge line, there are no trees up on that ridge line at all. Um, so that's bare, bare ground that you've got to come across if you're attacking the men down amongst the brush and the trees. You have to um, come across this open land, which I would personally not want to do. It speaks highly of the men that were prepared to do that. So there are some walking trails here. One of the walking trails is known as the Roman Nose Trail. It takes you back up to where one of the Indian encampments was. But I think that's it. Um, I made it to Beaches Island. So hello, Dad. Thanks for <laughs> thanks for giving me that book back in oh, the 1970s when I was a little kid and I was interested in watching cowboy movies on BBC television with you on Saturday afternoons and you were like here read this book this was my book when I was a kid and I read that book and I like this story and I finally made it all the way out here years later but I made it out here so I'm just moving into a piece of shade it's starting to get quite warm so I'm glad I made it out here um, the lesson of that is the places that you want to go to, go to. For God's sake, go to them. Don't wait to go to them. I waited a long time to come here. I'm still fit and able to get to these places. God forbid I waited another 20 years and I was in my 70s and was sat and sitting around saying, well, you know, I could have gone when I was younger, but I didn't. And I'm now feeling too old to go to these places. So if you want to go to places, if you want to explore places, if you want to walk the ground, on these battlefields, on these historic sites, then get out and do it um, as much as you can and as often you can. I had a day off today. I had a day where I got nothing to do today and I decided that I would drive all this way out here, um, walk around, take some photographs, think about where I am and uh, then drive back again. So go visit the places that you've always wanted to visit. Don't put it off until it's too late. Thanks for giving me that book, Dad. Hope you enjoy the video. <laughs> I wish you were here with me. I dearly wish you were here with me. <sighs> See you guys.